webinar before the end of the year. I see a lot of my friends and uh, clients on, uh, on the uh, program right now, and I appreciate you guys showing up for this. There is a um, chat functionality or a question area in your little uh, go to meeting or go to webinar control panel. So if anything comes up as we go and you want to ask something that's uh, timely and in sync with where we are uh, at this point in the uh, presentation, fire those questions out because it's always good to kind of address those kind of in line and, and in real time. Okay, so feel free to do that. If I miss any, I'll try to collect them all at the end and address those when we conclude. Okay, so again, thanks for being here. Um, we're going to talk today about supercharging your qual research and what we're going to do specifically is go through five methods of how to really combine face-to-face -face, um, with online asynchronous technology, okay? So to give you a little backstory, um, the whole reason we got into the online space was I was a moderator, much like many of you, and in the early 2000s, we started to worry about this internet thing, you know, kind of encroaching on the research space, and particularly on face-to-face -face because the technology was there for good data collection. So what we ended up doing was you know, kind of putting our brains together. I have two partners and the two, the three of us got together and said, hey, you know, what can we do to, you know, at least protect our futures should face to face go away? And I had some technology background from 98 to 2002, and that allowed me to actually tap into some uh, tech guys. And we actually put a team together. We built our first platform called Living Diary, and we ran that one through 2012. And then we built AHA on newer technology and launched that in 2012, 2013. So during that time period, um, you know, we did not see face-to-face -face go away. There's definitely been an encroachment by the online space and online methodology into the face-to-face -face world, but it certainly has not made face-to-face -face go away. So what I wanna to talk to you about today is how these two actually work together to make better research happen. So it's really a beautiful thing when you can do a hybrid approach where you've got asynchronous online methodologies running in tandem and in concert with you know, face-to-face -face stuff, some of it in person and a lot of it via the web, via webcam interviews, webcam groups, whatever it happens to be. So the way we kind of like to look at it, we're trying to figure out the right you know, um, acronym or, or association for, or anomaly for um, you know, figuring out what was the best combination. And we went through a bunch of them. We kind of came up with uh, something that we actually like and is near and dear to our hearts, and that's rock and roll. So face-to-face -face and online qual from our perspective now go together like rock and roll. So what's changed? Um, a lot of things have changed over the years. We've seen Steve Jobs uh, introduce the iPhone 11 or 12 years ago. That changed the uh, research space dramatically, especially when it came to doing any kind of you know, technology-driven video stuff in the moment, in the home, out and about the smartphone really changed the world. We've seen things really progress over the years. There's uh, several players out there that are doing live face-to-face, -face, um, you know, uh, interviewing, webcam groups, et cetera. And then what we've had for us is we always were on the fence about, do we build our own face-to-face -face tool? Um, we have definitely great mobile tools, great video, webcam tools, et cetera, but they're all asynchronous or were asynchronous in the past. And then voila, out came Zoom, and we became their first integrated channel partner this year in uh, relatively right around May, we launched our first project with those guys. Mm -hmm. So we've integrated Zoom into our platform. So that gives us the ability to have, you know, webcam-based interviewing live face-to-face -face mm -hmm. between a respondent and a moderator. Mm -hmm. And what we like to do is to see that in concert with asynchronous methods, but sometimes, you know, just face-to-face -face webcam interviews are, are well enough, and sometimes it's great in combo. So what I'm going to do today is actually take you through what I think are the five most popular combinations of, you know, asynchronous and live face-to-face, -face. okay? So with that said, a little background on me. A lot of you know me, so um, I don't want to get too deep into this. You guys know I'm a proud native Detroiter. Our headquarters are here just outside of Detroit, Northville. Um, I cut my teeth in the market research and, and brand management uh, area in the 90s more at Pepsi, more as a, a buyer of market research and, and a great respecter of what it can do. Um, as I mentioned to you before uh, as well, is that you know I got my technology immersion and really got into the architecture of technology and how to deploy um, you know, engineers to be able to create things that we can envision. And so my immersion there really um, came together with you know, my market research background and my brand marketing background to lead us into this online space um, for asynchronous market research and now live market research. So um, 
I consider myself an online qual pioneer. I did my first study with some sort of gerrymandered uh, data collection tool, CRM tool back in 2005. It was very basic, but it definitely worked for open-ended questions, which is kind of where things all started uh, for online qual. Uh, as I mentioned, we launched AHA in 2012, and we've grown and innovated ever since. Um, it's been a really, really fun ride, and we've been really taking advantage of uh, the technology that's been presented to us both for things that we can develop ourselves and also things that we can partner with other people on, such as I mentioned, the Zoom Global Integration Partnership that we started this year. So the things we do, again, real quick commercial here. You guys know we all do study design. We've got lots of different tools. And if you guys come to us, and I know several of you on this uh, call uh, have used us in this regard where we brainstorm usually every study. You know, it's like, hey, let's get on the phone. Let's talk about the tools, your objectives, figure out what the best study design might be. We will program for you. We program about 90% of the studies that come our way. Um, the reason for that is, is a lot of the things are very technical in nature. When you get into our dynamic canvas or our projective collage tool, um, some of our video tools, the mobile stuff, it gets a little bit tricky and it's better for us to actually program it. Although, as I mentioned, about 10% of the, the clients and projects that go through the platform are programmed on a DIY basis by heavy users, okay? We can recruit for you. So any project that does come up that you need a, a recruit bid, if it's something that's possible, um, we certainly have the resources to tap into outside recruiting sources that will bring the sample that you need to the party. Uh, we use the best of the best, and our studies typically have uh, completion rates close to or exceeding 90%. So 90% of those recruited to a study successfully complete everything that's that's put in front of them over the course of several days. Okay. Um, project management, we put a project management eye on everything. And the whole idea there is we want to help with the respondent engagement, share all the best practice information with you, actively monitor, monitor your studies to make sure they're successful. Because one of the, the sayings that we have is that failure is not an option and we want to make sure you guys look good, we look good, everybody looks good to your client. Okay. If you ever do anything international, we can handle all any language on the platform. We can handle the translations as well. And then if you ever get yourself in a bind or you need us to do the analysis, we can do that for you too. So we can write study guides. We can do analysis. We can moderate. You can kind of a la carte that uh, depending on which, you know, what you have an appetite for. Okay. So what we're going to do is go over five creative approaches today. So the first one is going to be digital ethnography followed by a webcam IDI. And I'll explain all this stuff a little bit more detail as we go through them individually. Um, I'll go through a combination of pre-IDI, then an online study, and then a post-IDI after the study's over. Um, we'll go through webcam concept testing, which is very interesting, both in a live and asynchronous fashion. But the video tools are very powerful for helping you get to the emotions and feelings around uh, respondents' reaction to different ideas. And then we'll go through webcam and projective exercises. So that's basically a little bit similar to concept testing, but it's not concepts. It's actually more around you know the feelings, attitudes, and emotions around buying and using goods and services. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about online homework, which is honestly one of the earlier spots that we really got into in the online space. Um, online homework that precedes live in-person focus groups in a focus group facility. Okay, so those are five areas we're going to go through. Um, so I will try not to speed through them too much. And again, if anyone does have questions, I'm just going to open up my little question box over here. And we will see what we got here. And it's, uh, let's see here. All right, there are a couple questions here from Gene. Um, yes, Gene makes a comment about 90% is very high um, uh, respondent uh, engagement. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it is really 90% 90, 90 plus on that. You say it's 50 to 70% complete. That's kind of normal, but our, our participation, if we bring 40 people into a study, you typically will get 36, 38 completes out of that 40, and sometimes we even hit 40. So Gene, yes, we have really, um, really, really good approaches to um, best practice management and, and uh, getting respondents engaged, okay? That's, that's for another time. I have done webinars on that before. If you want to reach out separately, I can send you a, a deck or a recorded webinar on exactly how we do that. So let's jump into the first one. So this is digital ethnos followed by a webcam IDI. Okay, and this is one of my favorite um, ways of doing the, the combination hybrid method. And interestingly, over the years, I have had hundreds of times where people have said, hey, um, can we do live webcam IDIs after the study's over? And I've referred them to other uh, you know, companies that do that kind of thing. 
And it, it became obvious that that needed to be a part of our portfolio. Uh, we, again, we looked at building that on our own, but Zoom's got thousands of engineers, which is um, a lot bigger than our tech department. So integrating them in gave us the, the world-class technology that we were really seeking and didn't have to build it ourselves. So um, we don't have to refer that out to anybody else anymore. So this is how those work. So what this allows you to do when you look at digital ethnos followed by webcam IDIs, it allows you to get the depth of asynchronous online and then probe deeper with your best respondents in a live webcam IDI. So typically you would have a three to five day study and, and for the most part, these tend to be anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes uh, in length per day of engagement, doing different types of activities. And I won't dive into all the things that our, our platform does. If you do wanna check our website out, uh, at ahaonlineresearch.com. That will go through all the methods that we have, and it's really a mix and match of different things depending on what your objectives are for a particular client and a particular study. So the cool thing is then you do the four, you know, three, four, five day study, then you pick your six uh, to 10 best people. And again, you can do more, you can do less, and then do a 45 to 60 minute interview. And I, I tend to be more in the 45 minute range, and even 30 minutes can be great. And what this allows you to do is actually probe deeper, get clarifications on respondents, enhance the connection between you and the respondents, and then get some video with some great quotes that allows you to support your uh, report storytelling. So this stuff, while you have great stimulus from the things that you do online, when you've got a little bit of video that really gets into some of the core uh, themes and insights that you have from your, your study, um, it really enhances your report that you present to your clients. So that's how that works. Visually, it kind of just to frame it up um, so you kind of get a picture of how this works. So you might do something like um, digital ethno where you may have, you know, hey, you're gonna do some collaging and you might do some storytelling. There may be some kind of give me a tour of your studio, your pantry, whatever it happens to be. Um, you can get into uh, our perceptual mapping, et cetera. So you'll have them do a variety of different things over a multi-day asynchronous study. And then again, you pick your six to 10. Again, that's not a fixed number, but that's usually the best um, kind of best practice approach to that. You select them and then you do your live face-to-face uh, -face interviews. Um, they're scheduled, um, they're recorded. Uh, there are um, also accompanying uh, transcripts that are automated AI transcripts. If anyone ever does need, let's say for a pharma study and you've got to have exact wording of everything, we can have human transcripts um, completed as well within 24 hours of the completion of the interview. Okay, so the best practice, and I'm going to show you this for each of the five methods. I'm going to kind of lay them out for you, give you a little visual representation, and kind of share with you some of the best practice stuff. So what you're going to do is you're definitely, going to, at the end of the study, you're going to pick your star respondents. You're going to know who those are through the, through the course of the study. Um, it's always nice to use some video uh, in the asynchronous um, area. So you may say, hey, turn your webcam on and answer a question just to kind of vet their camera friendliness. Are they, are they camera friendly? Are they comfortable in front of a camera? Can they share an emote? And you would be surprised. I mean, we've got people that have really no experience doing this oftentimes, and they do a truly um, candid and amazing job of communicating verbally with the camera on. So in, in an asynchronous and in a live fashion. So um, if there is any need to do that, you know, you also can identify the more tech savvy people. Obviously you recruit them to be tech savvy, but it's also great to have them be able to, uh, you know, turn on their webcam and have a conversation. You want to get segment representation. So if you do have, let's say, three segments and you want to do, you know, six people, uh, you'll want to get two from each of those particular segments. And then I really recommend we do have scheduling tools on board. And if we recruit this for you, we'll actually have the recruiter professionally schedule uh, the actual interviews. So everything is, you know, synchronized and people are where they're supposed to be. They've got their credentials. And the really nice thing about this is if there's an asynchronous study that precedes the face to face, they already come into the platform all the time anyway, and they just pop back in at the appropriate time. There are reminders. They come in, they open up Zoom, and they do the actual call. And if anybody's noticed, it's kind of funny. We have, this is our last webinar on GoToWebinar. Um, we will be switching over to using the uh, Zoom webinar tool next year. So that will be obviously an integration and support of the tool that we actually use every day for our regular meetings and then for our, our research-oriented stuff. Okay. So incentives too, um, you got to incent appropriately. So typically for a 45 minute IDI with regular consumers, it might be 75 bucks. If you're going B2B, it's obviously going to be significantly higher. Okay. 
So that's uh, method number one. That was my favorite. Um, this is a really cool one. I've got a client that came up with this way of doing things um, a couple of years ago, and she did a lot of this stuff. She loves this approach, and I love it too. Um, the way that she did things is she would actually kick off every study with a pre-IDI. So she would have a phone call, typically a phone call. Now it's webcam. So she would do just a 30-minute warm-up, you know, get to know these people. I mean, I always believe in moderator introductions, usually a video, but it's just they just play the video when they get into the study. This is a way to actually have a conversation to get to know these people. Um, it, the great thing about that is, A, there's a relationship that's established one-to-one, -on, one -one, and it's actually conversational. It's real. It's live. It's recorded. And, um, and there's also that ability to then get people to start thinking about what the topic is going to be about. So the objectives of the study are basically laid out, what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, how candid they should be, how honest and open, et cetera. And they really get a good feel for what it is they're going to be doing over the next several days or a year. Some studies are short, some are longer, um, but typically that, that usual asynchronous study is uh, three to five days in length. Okay. Then there's the online study piece that they do that obviously there's some active moderator probing uh, throughout, but again, it is asynchronous. And then following that, again, similar to the first method, uh, you've got the post IDI. So again, 30 to 60 minutes, face to face recorded. Okay. So the combination of this basically allows you to increase the respondent engagement by getting them warmed up, understanding what's happening. You develop this relationship with each individual respondent. And this particular moderator, actually, if they have, she has 40 people in a study, she'll actually have these conversations with all 40 people. Okay. It does stimulate interest in the study topic area. So they know what we're going to talk about. They get a sense of what their role is in the whole research process and it kind of opens them up softens them up to share and trust and emote uh, everything they can uh, contribute to whatever the topic is okay um it does en enhance the conversation and commitment during the online phase because they know the moderator they feel committed to that there's actually a little bit of a friendship built so again those 90 percent plus respondent rates they're they come real close to 100 if not 100 in this particular methodology and then it um, really brings the story home with the wrap-up IDI. So that IDI at the end, again, fills in gaps, answers things, gains emphasis. And again, by that point in time, the moderator is going to have a lot of, of insights and themes that they think are appropriate. And so what they're going to do at that point, um, you know, is be able to then zero in on those things and actually get live quotes that support whatever those findings might be if they didn't pick them up in other areas, okay, through other exercises. And I see a, a comment here from my good friend, Mike. Do I have a recommended sample size for digital ethnos? Absolutely. So that that typically, I would say anywhere from 28 to 40 is kind of the perfect number. Um, four days is kind of ideal. And, you know, when if whenever it needs to be bigger, it's usually because there's a bunch of segments. If somebody comes in with five segments, you may want to recruit 75 to the qual phase, okay, to the to the online phase or to the study itself. Um, if the budget's really tight and you have a couple segments, you can go as low. I've had people go as low as 10. So, but I think that 28 to 40 is really the sweet spot. And some of that is dictated by segments. Um, some, of, some of it's also dictated by budget. So you may have somebody that comes back to you go, God, I can't do 40. What can we do for X number of dollars? And it might be 32. Um, or we can shave a day, add a day if there's opportunity to do that as well. So, so that is, um, so 28 to 40, Mike, is really the ideal number. So moving right along, get back on the right page here. Okay, um, the way this visually looks, so again, you got your, your pre-IDI, this is your moderator here, this is your respondent, these people have a good conversation. Typically those are only 30 minutes in length. You don't need to go terribly long, but it is a great warm up and a really, really cool live uh, introduction to the study, what the objectives are, again, what they're supposed to do over the course of the days. So it does soften them up and get them into the topic area quickly. Then in this asynchronous online phase, they're going to do a bunch of different things. A lot of times there's a store trip involved. They might be doing some kind of a task like doing the laundry. Um, there's social opportunities. There are opportunities to go through journey mapping um, and then a little ideation type session. So again, we've got tons of tools. And again, it's just really a mix and match of the appropriate tools for the objectives of the study. And then finally, again, you pick your best six to 10 IDIs. And in this case here, this is the moderator. This is um, one of my business partners, Jim White, and this is his respondent. And these guys jumped on a call and these are very engaging calls. By the time they've done this stuff up front, 
there's been a huge commitment to the process itself and then you're into this IDI at the end, it's, it really becomes a deep, connected, uh, friendly, and, and very energetic discussion. So it's cool, super cool stuff. And um, we also have a video clipper on our site. So any of this video, whether it's asynchronous or this live stuff, um, these videos are on the site. There are, as I mentioned, AI-driven automated transcripts, but also you have the ability to grab clips just by highlighting text and dropping those into a little film reel at the end, okay? So best practice approach on that, that upfront piece gets you acquainted with your respondents. Um, you get to explain the study in detail. I kind of covered this already. Get the probe, you know, with insider knowledge during that asynchronous phase, because you know who these people are. Um, you get to fill in your, your knowledge gaps with the post IDI. And again, reinforce your insights. If you're looking for really killer clips, that's a great way to get the quotes that you need to really help tell your story. And then it allows you to leverage the relationship to solicit, you know, truly candid insights. Again, you really soften them up and get close to them in that first phase. So moving on to number three, this is webcam concept testing. And this can be done a couple of different ways. So you can do this live, which is super cool, or you can do it asynchronously where they actually record themselves doing something. And I'll explain those two in detail here. So the key thing, whether it's, it's asynchronous or a live moderator, watching somebody actually do or go through a concept themselves and then comment on things and say what they like, what they don't like, et cetera. Um, what you want to do is have them narrate their reactions, the thoughts and feelings about ads, packaging, positioning statements, new products, whatever it happens to be. So you really want to set it up up front and you want to you know, explain exactly what it is they're supposed to do. And as much as you can, you, you want to let them take over and talk about the concepts. So you've got really three options here. So respondents can asynchronously record their review of ideas. And the whole idea there is that they'll come in and they'll do things you know, um, uh, independently, but they'll be recorded as they go. So Zoom will actually record their screen actions and the narration of what they're doing uh, throughout that particular review of that idea. Um, the other way is, the second way would be the moderator is actually live on board with them and shares the concepts with the respondents. So they're actually looking at them together. And then number three could be combining one and two as a process. So it could be uh, respondents asynchronously recording, and then you could go over those later with the moderator to get more in depth and more detail about what it is they thought and felt when they went through it the first time around. And interestingly, they will, when they narrate the review of concepts, they, they give you a lot more depth than they would if you asked them to write out answers uh, on the platform itself and an open-ended question, okay? So this is kind of how it works. So the moderator review, so you'll have the, typically in this situation, it is going to be the respondent that is actually on the screen um, in a smaller screen, and then they will be reviewing concepts and ideas. And again, you want to kind of set it up so that they kind of freeform uh, talk about things. You know, what do they like? What don't they like? What might they do to make it better? They'll go through that kind of stuff, and then you kind of start your Q&A. So you want to kind of let them, you know, let the leash be long, let them talk as much as they want about things, and you go from there. The asynchronous methodology is their presented ideas. And by the way, in both methodologies, there is concept rotation built into the platform. Um, and if it's multi-day, we do that as well. We call that our true rotation tool. And so what you got there is you, you eliminate any order bias, which I know you guys are all familiar with. So asynchronously, you just present the ideas, usually open-ended questions, maybe a quant scale, just to get some context and some feeling about how they're reacting to an idea. And not that you're gonna use it as a quant number that you're gonna project in a, in a meeting, um, but it does give you some context and again, ability to kind of create some variance points where you can actually um, sort ones from fives, et cetera, to get, you know, see which one ideas were actually reacted to with the most po positive feelings and then those that had the most negative feelings. So you get a little bit of a polar opposite um, opportunity to do some analysis there, okay? Let's see here, I got a question here that I'm gonna grab before I go too far. Um, yes, the, the clients, yes, they do um, actually view. So this is Jan asking a question here. They do actually um, uh, do participate um, in the viewing. We typically don't have the moderator actually interviewing, or excuse me, the client actually interviewing, but they can jump in with questions, but typically it's a backroom chat between the uh, moderator and the clients to kind of do some probing. It's not great, as you guys know, even as I do this, it's kind of tricky to actually follow a chat string while you're doing an interview. So, you know, the, the, the more that they can sit by and passively observe, the better. 
And um, let's see here now. And Jean has a question here. Is there a transcription in the moment close close after a video or audio recording? Yes, there is. So it typically takes, you know, longer interviews, you know, 30 minutes or so. It may take 15 or 20 minutes for a, that automated transcript to appear. And again, it is machine learning, not totally perfect, but it certainly is a great transcript to go on. If the audio quality is great, it's going to be obviously better. So moving along here. So the best practice approach for this webcam concept testing, um, if they're doing it asynchronously, um, most particularly here, you want to be super, super clear um, with the instructions. You know, hey, narrate as you go. We want to understand every thought and feeling you have as you go through this idea. And by the way, this applies to UX as well. So if somebody's reviewing a, a web page, for instance, you want them to narrate every movement they might make with their mouse or where they might click, et cetera, and why they clicked. So narration by the respondent is super, super critical there. And you got to communicate that very, very succinctly to them that they have to do that. That's where the gold is, of course. Um, the number of concepts per day or interview, we don't think that it's good to go beyond two or three max per day. If you do a qual deep dive, what typically happens there um, is once they get past, and we've learned this over the years of doing online research, once they get past two or three ideas, they start to get fatigued. They start writing less and less. So same thing for talking. They're going to talk a little bit less and less. And when they get past two or three concepts, what they're going to also end up doing is starting to blur. So they might refer to something back in the first concept. So it gets a little bit tricky there. So we like to kind of keep them fresh each day. So if you have six ideas and depending on your budget, you're going to want to spread those over two or three days. Okay. It's definitely the better way to approach it. If you do that via live webcam, yeah, you can do two different sessions, or maybe you just show two or three ideas to certain segments and kind of rotate things around that way. So, there's different ways to do it, and, and you certainly can do interviews, you know, live interviews um, over a couple of days to go through two or three concepts per day, and it may be a comparative exercise at the end. We think that, you know, beyond, again, this, this fatigue factor sets in at about the 30-minute mark. So, again, if you have three ideas, that typically might take them 30 minutes to do. Um, two ideas might be 20. So, that's why we kind of have this, this best practice approach of, you know, the 20 to 30-minute, you know, sitting going through two or three ideas uh, in a deep dive qual sort of way, okay? Um, you want to obviously follow the exact line of questioning for each idea. Everything has to be very structured. So whatever you know, concept they're looking at, the line of questioning and, and what they'll do for each concept is going to be identical, whether it's live or if it's asynchronous. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, you definitely want to use concept rotation to avoid any order bias, okay? And we've got some cool tools to do that, as again, I mentioned. All right, four. So four is a, let's see if we got another question here. I think we're okay and we're cleared on that. Yep, we do have one from Martha. Hello, Martha. Do you ever recommend doing the moderated review with a group of respondents versus one-on-one? -on -one? Actually, I don't, Martha. And, and you can do that, but I am not a fan. Um, and I, there's a lot of moderators that agree with me on this. The multiple people thing can work and a max of three is probably right. But when you get into four, five or six, it really gets kind of crazy. But we're really strong on doing the one on one. There's no uh, group bias. There's nobody dominating over anyone else. So we really like that personal discussion between you and the respondent without, you know, three or five or six or eight respondents, you know, doing the, um, uh, the Brady Bunch kind of approach. So it's much more effective to go one on one. Um, and again, if you do concept testing, you know, that's a situation where I mentioned six to 10 after an asynchronous study is great. If you do concept testing, you probably want, you know, to go to that 28 to 40 interviews. Okay. And if you want to break them up over a couple of days, it certainly can work if you've got a lot of concepts. Okay. So hopefully that answers that question for you. So this next one is uh, webcam and projective exercise. So this is pretty cool. Very similar to concept testing, but what you're going to do is you may have somebody do a collage. So, what we want to do here is, again, combining people actually doing an exercise while you are actually watching. And again, this can be done asynchronously, but it's really cool to have them, let's say, go pick from a bank of 50 images, five images that describe how they feel about, you know, healthy snacks for their kids, for instance. Um, what this allows you to do is get live explanations of thoughts, thoughts and feelings. Again, very similar to the, the approach, you know, with concept testing. And again, these can be done asynchronously or live with a moderator. Um, it's easier for respondents to speak than to type reactions. And, and what I mean by that is typically what we do, we do a lot of collage. It's in almost every study that's non-concept oriented that we do. 
And what it allows for people to do is, is actually, you know, just speak into their microphone while they're looking or building their collage, explaining why they're picking each image, what image that role, that, that, what image that, that, that whatever that image role plays in that particular uh, task. They're able to actually pick those, explain why they picked it, um, what it represents to them, and they can give you that in a lot more detail than they would if they were typing it. Because typically what we do is have them build a collage. They can drop, you know, little words or phrases onto each image to describe how they feel about that. But then there's also that ability to then, um, you know, uh, go write open-ended responses like, hey, tell us how this collage relates to the task. You know, please explain your, your thoughts and feelings. When they speak to that, they give you a lot more depth than they do if they have to write it. So there's definitely an advantage there to having them do it asynchronously or live, but actually talk you through the tasks. Okay. It definitely inspires more feeling, sharing, and connecting with the ideas and the process or the task at hand. And they produce more content, as I mentioned, verbally than they would um, when they write stuff down. Okay. And then again, the really cool thing is to have them narrate and, and kind of do it you know, in front of you, if it is a live discussion, live face-to-face, -face, and they're actually showing you their screen, they're showing you that collage, they're showing you the image bank, they're going through the images. You want them to narrate that process and kind of let them take over. Let them do it, let them walk through it uh, and explain things to you in their words and jump in where you have to. So again, this is kind of what it looks like. This is a journey um, of a commute to work using our dynamic canvas. And so this allowed them to pick images and they dropped three images into each column that described each step of the way or stage of their commute. So I associate my commute with, during my commute I feel, while I'm commuting I spend my time doing X, Y, Z and the role their vehicle plays in the commute. So they're actually gonna go fill in these 12 images into these columns and then explain that as they do it. And then instead of addressing each column in written form, you're actually gonna have them just talk to, hey, why did you pick those three images for this particular column? So again, it can be done asynchronously or live. I think it's a little more effective in this case live, of course, because you can kind of probe right on the fly. And if it is asynchronous, you can still probe. But again, I think those live probes are much more timely and in real time. And then while this is going on, you've got the two people, the two participants, the moderator, again, Jim in this case, and his respondent here who are actively and, and energetically engaged in the process of picking images to describe their thoughts and feelings and actions over the course of whatever the task might be. So that's the webcam for projective exercises. So best practice here, instruction's critical, narration is critical. Um, try not to in interrupt their stream of consciousness. We all can be guilty as moderators from time to time of getting kind of amped up and excited and wanting to jump in, and, but you really have to sit back and listen. So you don't want to interrupt. You want them to kind of go through their narration process. And if they need a little steering or a little urging or a little more depth in a certain point in time, you know, take a deep breath, let the pause happen, let a little silence happen, and then jump in with your probe. Okay. Um, yeah, don't feel compelled to jump in. I mean, a lot of times these people can walk through this stuff in, in, in great detail. And when they're done, then you can actually dive through and, and kind of go through it in more detail and, and kind of tease out some of the, the findings and insights that you're seeing as you observe them uh, conduct or complete the task. Okay, so remember, you're an observer here. You're not the star. You're just basically there to kind of steer the conversation when uh, the gaps or time uh, breaks allow or when they're completed with the actual um, uh process itself, okay? And, and then what we wanna do too is you wanna focus is on, on the images, you wanna focus on images or words that are associated with the emotions, okay? This is usually our projective techniques are all about the emotions and collage is a perfect tool to do this kind of thing, okay? So that's our fourth and then here's our final one here. And this is online homework uh, preceding focus groups. And this is pretty cool because we started doing this Probably our first go at this was when we introduced our collage tool in 2007. And it was super cool as a, as a tool for focus groups. And I'll tell you what, um, obviously we, you know, a lot of you guys are moderators, if not everybody on this particular call. And what's really, really cool here is um, the ability to have them do an exercise before they actually show up to groups. Anybody who's been around doing focus groups for a while, you probably have done the technique of, hey, you know, create a collage and bring it to the groups. That's fantastic. But some people don't complete the collage. They don't do a good job of it. The really cool thing of asynchronous, let's say, collage exercising before they get to groups is you can say, hey, your due date is three days before the group. 
and then you can actually have the facility or the recruiter follow up if people haven't done it. And the moderator gets a chance to review things in advance. Clients can see things in advance. All the collages are sorted by groups. So when people are in the back room, they can actually see, you know, group one and, and let's say the six to eight collages uh, uh, submitted by the people in the actual study or in that group. Um, and, and so you'll be familiar with what they're going to, what they produced, what they're thinking, what they're feeling. And it's a great icebreaker to get the conversation going. So I have a question here from Mark. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? Send some sh sunshine my way. It's uh, a little bit cold over here. Um, it says, I like the individual intro uh, by moderator with each respondent. So no more uh, moderator introductory vid videos. Yeah, um, Mark, that kind of refers back, I think, to number two, which was the um, pre-IDI. So, yeah, you really don't have to do moderator intros in that particular case. Obviously, if you're doing something live as well, um, if you're doing like a projective technique live, um, yeah, absolutely, you just introduce yourself there. So, yeah, that does go away. But, Mark, you know, anytime you're just doing asynchronous and there's no pre-IDI, I definitely love the moderator introductory videos, um, notes, um, whatever it happens to be to kind of, again, warm people up and get them to know who you are. All right, so let's get into the fifth one. So this is the, the online homework. So this is kind of, you know, old school stuff. It's been going on for a while. Again, it started in analog um, fashion with people going through magazines and cutting out pictures and taping them to a piece of paper and bringing them to the group. Um, and so this one here, um, this is a great way to supercharge your groups. And I'm going to explain one technique in a minute that really, really, and actually it's the second point here. Um, give respondents an individual social task to complete in advance. And that social task, now doing a collage is cool. Gets them closer to the subject matter, gives the moderator tons of stimulus to conduct the groups and things to probe on and whatnot. Social tasks are where each individual focus group, um, the people, let's say if there's eight in a group, they'll be in their own little discussion board before the group even happens. So we've got three different tools. One's like Pinboard, one's like Facebook, Snooze Feed, and the other one is the Wishing Wall, which is our ideation tool. If you have people do those kinds of things before they get to the group, they actually know each other. And when they show up in the lobby, it's, it's like, you know, giddy. People are just talking, they're laughing, they know each other, there's no introduction needed when they get in the room. And the energy level is amped up dramatically. So it saves you about 10 minutes and kind of the warm up and here's what we're doing and here's the people in the group, tell me about yourself. They already know each other. And if they get there beforehand, 15 minutes before the group in the lobby, I mean, it's, it's usually pretty raucous and fun and everybody's talking like they've known each other for a long time. So that's a super, super cool way to supercharge groups by doing a pre-focus homework assignment. Okay, so collage, storytelling, social discussions, those are the perfect areas. Store trips are cool too, um, before groups. And again, store trips with pictures, store trips with video. It really, again, just gets people's head into what it is you guys are going to be talking about in the group. So again, you get so much more out of the physical, you know, uh, facility-oriented uh, focus group process. Um, okay, kind of already covered that one. Video and the store trip. Again, that's super cool too. Again, go, having people, you know, give you a tour of the pantry of their house of their whatever it happens to be, whatever the, the product category might be, the laundry room, et cetera. Again, it gets you closer to them as well and, and also stimulates the uh, clients to get a little bit more engaged because they kind of know these people as well when they show up. So they're kind of paying attention a little bit more and it does create a little bit more familiarity, a little bit more interest on their side to engage from behind the glass, okay? So the way that works, again, here's this is um, just a little collaging kind of approach, projective in nature, our storytelling, very popular for um, uh, for pre-focus group homework. This is the social pin board. Um, think Pinterest there, images and text, likes and comments, et cetera. Our social um, uh, news feed, which is again like Facebook's news feed with likes and comments, ability to post video and pictures is also really, really strong. So uh, let's see here if I've got any other ones I've got. Oh, you're welcome, Mark. Got your little note there. And then um, over here, obviously the live focus group. So when people show up, things rock and roll. The cool thing is you know who's completed things. We've got a scorecard, other people probably do too, but there's a scorecard so you know exactly the status. So if you say be done three days in advance or two days in advance, if they're not completed, there is that ability to reach out and have the, um, the focus group facility actually call these people and say, hey, we really need your collage. Can you get in there as soon as possible? We do have communication tools on the platform as well, but sometimes that, that relationship between the facility and the um, respondent is usually pretty strong and it, it also aids you know that that relationship and if there is any accountability 
and they're going to jump in there and do it, they'll do it. If not, they get replaced. Okay, so you get active, engaged people um, who've done their homework assignment who actually show up at the groups. Okay. And it can also give you a chance to vet people too. Um, let me come back over to this one. If they did a bad job, you know, you can again use the homework as you see here to disqualify any of the respondents. Um, you want to allow enough time to complete it well in advance. So best practice wise, Give them a couple days, you know, before the groups to get them in because uh, and you want to give them a couple days to do them. If it's a store trip, definitely plan maybe five days ahead of time. Um, you don't want to put people in a jam where they're going to miss it or have to uh, bail out because they couldn't get it done. If you give them plenty of time, both for whatever online activity you might do or a store trip, you certainly have the time to do that. Um, again, if anybody does a really bad job, is inarticulate, uh, just doesn't care obviously you replace them so you get rid of duds so you you increase the quality of the respondents that are in your groups um, the cool thing here too is share the exercises uh, with your clients beforehand um, and allow backroom access so what happens on a lot of these and these happen all the time we got people doing these like crazy is in the back room um, people are actually the clients you just go back and say hey man log in go to group one and then there's a scrolling you know the board that they uh, if it's social there's the board, they can read everybody's responses, all the comments, all the likes, et cetera, and kind of process that. Or if it's collages, they can look at those one one on one, one by one, and then also read the open ends that that explain the collage and what the feelings and emotions are associated by those respondents as they build their collage. So it really, really increases the engagement level for clients as well. So super cool thing to do there. Um, and, and sometimes this happens too, where we have clients who actually you know, our moderator clients will actually um, project these like on a screen, uh, whether it's on a big monitor, on a screen, whatever, or actually print them out and hand them out to the group and talk about everybody's, um, you know, collage, for instance, or talk about everybody's story. So it really creates a tremendous amount of, of you know, almost um, history with whatever the process is for this particular study. So when they all show up, they've got something, you know, they've thought about it. They have feelings about it. They've reacted to it, and they love to see how other people have gone through the same process. So it's an amazing, you know, stimulus for group discussion as well. Um, <laughs> and then this last one is just kind of funny. In the social activities, discourage any flirtation amongst respondents. And I say that because it was really funny. A few years back, we had a dog breeder study where there were, you know, um, a mix of males and females in that group, and. There was definitely some flirtation by one of the guys uh, towards one of the other uh, dog breeders in the uh, particular social study before the group. So we had to make sure there was no kind of uh, tension there of any kind um, when they showed up. So we had to remove the dude from uh, from actually participating in the actual focus group. But um, it was a pretty funny little thing that happened. Uh, the fun things we have happen in market research. So that was the fifth one. And then um, as we close in here, we're at 145. So we're doing pretty good here on time. Here's my final thoughts, um, and you guys, so as I you look back at, you know, 15, 16, 17 years ago when I was worried, as were my partners about, you know, face-to-face -face going away and our moderator careers being, you know, run aground, um, we have learned that that did not happen. And those two methodologies truly work better in tandem than they do separately. So. Whenever you can combine those, it certainly makes things a lot, lot better for you, a lot better for your client, more fun for the respondents, and it leads to better research. Um, second point here, you know, um, we run into a lot of situations where somebody uh, like a moderator like yourselves, my, or, you know, I know we've got clients online here as well, but somebody may say, you know, I really um, want to do, I love your asynchronous methodology, but I really love face-to-face, -face and I, I don't want to miss out on having that as a part of it. So we're, we're thinking we may just go to focus groups. And then we step in and say, hey, now we can combine both. So let's go ahead and do your you know, asynchronous uh, approach um, with some social activities too, if you want some interaction amongst respondents, you know, online asynchronously. And then let's do the six to 10 webcam IDIs. And, and the successful sell rate of that is fantastic. So we've been doing this really since May of this year. And adding that on as an option, I mean, it seems like everybody wants at least added on as a uh, proposal option, but I would say the hit rate is probably 75 to 80% of people who actually ask for that option to be uh, proposed and quoted actually buy that as well. 
So the combination of these two methods is obviously very popular with everybody. I don't have to refer people out to other sites. All the data is on one site in one place for moderators to break the data down and do their analysis and for clients to refer back to the action and kind of see all the uh, things that they want to learn, understand, observe, et cetera, as part of the process. Um, so this leverages the online tech, tech capabilities with the humanity of face-to-face. -face. Now, technology, because of the you know video capabilities that are out there, um, because of the social uh, capabilities that platforms have these days, there is a human nature to it. And, and as the question came up from Mark about moderator intros and, and then respondent intros that usually follow that, in video format, yeah, that creates some human connection, but then there's the live human part too that really, again, makes sure that nothing is missed as far as uh, maxing out on the capabilities uh, of your study, okay? Um, so at the end of the day, this ultimately inspires a deeper and more engaged respondent. So the beauty here is that these people, you know, they're, they're you get to know them. Um, they get to know you. Uh, Asynchronous methods are great for doing that, but when you can layer in the face-to-face, -face, it really hits a home run for you. And at the end of the day, the really most important thing is you guys have to write or receive great stories, um, you know, from your moderators or clients who write their own stuff and do their own thing. Um, this gives you stimulus to create a more powerful story with the stimulus to support the insights and findings that you've come up with during the analysis and the running and the analysis of your study. So all in all these things, these two things together, again, face to face and online, asynchronous, um, amazing combination. Uh, and, and we're really honestly thrilled without being too much of a commercial to have added that to our portfolio of tools uh, that allows us to combine these two great methods in one place. Okay. So that said, um, Anybody fire any more questions in if you got some, and I will um, go over those. This is my contact information. So if anybody wants to grab a, a screen cap of this um, or, you know, just write it down. But obviously my phone number, I'm always up for brainstorming about studies, methodologies, best ways to approach things. I live on that. And, and most of you who are on this call know that. Um, we love to get involved in the study, the activity guide development, at least from a high level brainstorming perspective give you guys a roadmap, put the pieces of the puzzle together with all the right techniques for the right parts of the study, um, and then either write your guide for you or you guys go off and write a great guide from there, okay? Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, shoot me an email here or there if you ever have questions, need quotes. Um, love, you know, the interaction, obviously, with all of you. And again, as 